few animal lovers out there have enjoyed many different aircraft on this show. We have featured the Hornet, the Eagle, the Viper, Tomcat, Tiger, Raptor, Warthog, and even most recently, the Moose. Well, put away your harpoons, because this week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, it's all about the carrier-based nuclear strike platform that also served electronic warfare, reconnaissance, and aerial refueling duties. They call it the A3 Sky Warrior, but we all know it better as simply the whale. Okay, he's got a missile off. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Man, can you believe it's already the end of July? I guess that means summer's already halfway over for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere. And for our friends down under, I guess the good news is winter's almost halfway over. But boy, this year just continues to fly by and oh man, it's hard to keep up. Anyway, hello and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. That's right, we are talking about the A3 or A3D Sky Warrior. And this is episode, good grief, what are we up to, 118? Man, like I said, things are just flying by. Unfortunately, we don't have a Warbird episode for you this week like we hoped, but uh, Boat's working real hard on that, and we'll hope to get you one not in August for reasons we'll talk about later, but hopefully in September. Well, I hope everyone's doing well. Things are doing pretty good here, all things considered. Uh, Let's see. We'll get to the Sky Warrior in a bit. You know the drill. A couple announcements and listener questions. So first off, I did want to mention that back on the Tiger Cruise episode, I made a misspeak. And you know how I always like to be authentic, factual, and personable. And so this is the factual part as part of my defense to my brother Rocky about the tower flyby that he was accusing me of. I said that I took off on runway 27. And in fact, Naval Air Station North Island in San Diego has runway 29. So my mistake, hadn't flown there in a little while. But speaking of that and him, we did have a beautiful celebration of life for Rocky on uh, that day. That episode came out, it was July 12th. It happened at the track where he perished, which was really difficult for me, frankly. I could tell as we were getting close to the track, my heart just started pounding, and it wasn't because I was expected to speak. I think it was just the tension of being there, and I went to the site where the uh, accident happened, and it was tough, but boy, a lot of people showed up. We had a really great ceremony. We stayed till sunset. It was great. So as I said on the C-17 episode, I don't plan to drag it out anymore. Obviously, my family and I miss my brother dearly. And for those of you who are maybe wondering, uh, he was killed in a motorcycle accident in uh, June, and we laid him to rest on July 12th, and uh, he's gone. He was my best friend. He was two years older. We had a lot of fun together over a lot of years. For the rest of us, now we got to figure out how life goes on. And importantly for the show, then uh, it, the show goes on, and we're going to continue to do that. All right, let's see. I want to just mention real quickly that we've had a little feedback on some of the advertisements that we feature here on the show recently. I just want to point out that we actually do have policy on what products and services we will and will not promote. Obviously, we won't promote any extremist groups. Uh, I've decided we're not going to do CBD products or ED meds, and we're not going to do politics outside of the news outlets that report on them. Some of you might take exception with that. As far as I'm concerned, anything between the spectrum of rough MSNBC to Fox News is fair game. I don't expect you to agree with who we advertise, and we don't certainly take their position. But if they're willing to step up and support the show, we'll put out an ad, and it's up for the listeners to take it or leave it. And in one case, I did get some feedback from a gentleman who is on Patreon, which is ad-free, and apparently he listened elsewhere. And so, at any rate, just want you to know that we do think about our advertisements. We do have some standards. Enough said on that. Let's see, got a couple listener questions, two emails, and a phone call to go over. The first email is from Craig. He says, I was channel surfing and came across Top Gun at the scene where the F-14 buzzes the tower. In your career as a fighter pilot, have you ever seen or encountered that stunt? (laughs) Well, good timing, Craig, because again, my brother Rocky and Kai, who is listening to that on the Tiger Cruise episode, would accuse me of doing such a thing. But as I defended myself, in fact, that was part of the course rules, was to take off and 
turn immediately. And that wasn't the control tower. That was just a tower over at the depot where I used to work that they were standing on top of. And I happened to go right over their heads. But no, that is pure Hollywood excitement and drama. If you do that in real life, you're going to get busted. That's just the end of it. I mean, you're going to lose your wings. You're not going to fly. Nothing good's going to come out of that. So I don't know of anyone who did that. The closest I can tell you is at the carrier out in the open sea. You can call up the air boss and ask for a flyby in between launch and recovery cycles when not much else is going on. And they love it because it's just a way to give the troops that work so hard on the flight deck a little show. And you just go up the port or uh, left side at about 200 feet or above, subsonic. If you've got the extra time and gas, the troops always say they appreciate it. So that's as close as we get, but that's legit. So short answer, Craig, no. All right, next, let's take a phone call. Hey, Jello. My name's Greg Moorhead. My son recently got into the Air Force Academy. He's actually out there right now. I was just going to make a suggestion because you probably have a lot of young listeners as well. You know, maybe have an episode about each of the different service academies. Talk about what it takes to get in there, you know, what it's like in there and uh, the experience. And then, you know, opportunities afterwards. So maybe that would help make up some kids' minds about what it's all about. You know, if you could do one for all of them, that would be awesome. Thanks a lot, Jello. Love your show. Take care. All right. Good idea, Greg. Thanks for your question and the suggestion. Now, here on the show, we actually have three different categories for potential episodes. One are the aspirational topics. So, for example, I always wanted to do one on NASA Dryden. Then I found out they turned into NASA Armstrong, but my researchers helped me find someone. And that was a really fun episode because I learned a lot. The other is when we have opportunities. In other words, someone might reach out and say, hey, I did this or flew that. Would you be interested in having me on the show? And so we get those. And then the third category is your category, and that is if it's requested. And we typically keep a list of those. We add all the suggestions and questions we get to that list. And so we'll definitely try to do that. I've wanted to do the same thing. I might have mentioned it before with recruiters. Like, give each one 15 minutes to do an hour-long episode, right? So Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and ask them the same questions and let them answer what they fly and how you get there and where can you be based and What's a deployment like? And I just haven't quite gotten around to that. There's so much topics and so much content out there. It's just hard to keep up. So we're doing our best. Thanks for the question, Greg. Be patient. We might be able to get to that next year. All right. Final question is from Jeremy. I noticed that the Blue Angels do not wear masks when they fly, just microphones that they speak through. Why is this? Well, good question, Jeremy. I was never a Blue Angel, but I know someone who was. Guido Bernacchi, you might remember him. He's been on the show a couple times now talking about Blue Angel transitions, and then he came back and gave us an update. So I put your question to him, and this is what he wrote back. The Blues have a waiver to use a boom mic during the demonstration, whether it's practice or show, and they do fly with the oxygen mask hooked up down by their left hip in case of an emergency or smoke and fumes. When transiting from show to show, the air boss, actually the flight boss in this case, I added air boss, so that's my fault, will call for masks in the climb or descent when above 10,000 feet. As to why, I suspect, Guido goes on, tradition plays a part like so many aspects of naval aviation, but it also serves a purpose. It is noticeably more comfortable flying without the weight of the mask, especially when you think about the wingman flying with their heads constantly elevated and often under G-forces throughout the demo. Additionally, the very precise and nuanced communication is clearer and thus easier to understand on the boom mic versus the mask. So there you go, Jeremy, and I appreciate the question as I do all of our questions. And in this case, I learned something too, because I'd always seen that and I figured it was probably something close to that, but Now we know from the authority. And speaking of Guido, he got out of the Navy and he's over training with a logistics company now, learning how to fly. I forget what airplane he got, but I uh, you know, reached out to him and said, hey man, once you get trained and looking for other things to do, maybe come over and lend us a hand more often. So we'll see if we can do it. So Guido, if you're listening, come on, man, come play. Everyone loves you. And I'm sure you could add a lot of value to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. 
All right. So with that, now we are ready for our feature interview. Now, a couple quick alibis, as we would call them in a debrief. Uh, in our case, just some caveats, as I also call them before we get into it. First off, we recorded this interview on September 11th of 2020, and I've been sitting on it ever since. I don't really have a good excuse why. I guess partly it's because I screwed up the audio a little bit, and it's not terrific, but it's good enough. I always get smeared for mentioning things that you guys don't seem to care about, but I do. But at any rate, some day we'll get that audio thing figured out when we've got a big fancy studio and professional engineers right there on the spot. At any rate, I've uh, been sitting on it just for no other reason than that. Plus, we're just looking for a place to squeeze it in. And also for you pronunciation purists out there, yes, we both say nuclear. I tried to fix this. Frankly, I don't think I can help it. I'm just going to say nuclear. I try to say nuclear. It just, I don't know, rolls off my tongue differently. It's easier to say nuclear, but I'll keep working on it. All right, never mind that. Let's get to the A3 Sky Warrior with Rick Morgan. It's going to be awesome. Let's do it. Well, here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, you know, some of the aircraft we cover, I know a little something about, which helps. And the longer this show goes, the less I know about some of these aircraft. And that is certainly true for today's aircraft, the A3 Sky Warrior, the Whale. There's some other terminology for this, but I'm not going to be able to figure this out. So we're going to need Rick Morgan's help. He's a retired United States Navy Lieutenant Commander. How's it going, Rick? Hi, doing fine. Excellent. You are definitely going to have to school me on this one because it's one of those aircraft I've seen on museums. I've heard about. It's got kind of a reputation also. Yes. And uh, you're going to help us learn all about it. But if you're familiar with the show, Rick, you know we got to start with you. Where are you from? Where'd you go to school? What'd you do in the military? And what are you doing now? My background is uh, Air Force brat all over the United States from my dad, who was a SAC and then finally an F-4s. Went to University of Missouri, graduated in 1978 as an ensign from the NROTC program. Went to train command, got my wings, started my first tour in A3s in the Sky Warrior down in Key West, Florida. Eventually moved on to the Grumman EA6B up and spent 12 years up in Whidbey Island flying Prowlers, which is my airplane I have the most flight time in. Got out in 1994, worked in the Pentagon for nine years. In fact, my uh, Pentagon office, I was a contractor, civil contractor at this point, working for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And my office was on the opposite side of the building when the airplane hit it on 9 11, 19 years ago. Oh, wow. I was not in the building that day. I'll tell people that, but got a lot of interesting stories on that one from the people I know who were there. They, I went in the building the following day, and I won't go into that. I've done that story, but it's quite memorable. I currently work, uh, let's just say, for a large aviation company in St. Louis and write naval aviation history and research naval aviation history in my spare time. Uh, I have five books out on the subject, including one on the A3. Background, it was uh, flight time was about 2,300 total hours in the U.S. Navy, almost 500 traps and one ejection. Oh, wow. Probably not from the A3, as I understand. That is true. Uh, it would be <laughs> pretty difficult to eject from an A3. Well, no, it was an A6B in 19, October 1984. Okay. Well, we will get to all that in a little bit. Uh, that sounds exciting. And uh, at the end here, feel free to plug your books. We always like to promote authors, and the rising tide lifts all the boats. So we're happy to help you get any of your books out there as well. But let's get to the A3, Rick. Let's start off with what was it designed to do? And I have to think this is a big airplane, probably designed, what, in the 50s? So I can almost guess at its role. Yeah, following the end of World War II, the formation of a separate U.S. Air Force in 1947, U.S. Navy had serious issues because there were people in very high places who started seriously questioning the uh, future of naval aviation and carriers in general. There were those that felt that strategic air command with intercontinental bombers like the B-36, which my dad actually flew, by the way, would be superior to carrier aviation. The Navy had to find a way to get nuclear weapons, atomic weapons on their carriers and have a viable delivery method to show, yeah, we have a role here too. We're not irrelevant anymore. By 1947, the United States Navy issued a request to industry for a large aircraft that could go basically a 1,000 miles one way, carry a nuclear weapon, and then return to the aircraft carrier. The RFP was met with derision in some places, non-belief in others. Realized most of the carriers back then were still Essex-class carriers, which were uh, roughly forty to 50,000 tons. You were never going to be able to put an airplane on that size of ship. Navy's goal was to put it on the new United States class carrier, which was CVA 58, which was canceled by the Truman administration. Huh. But these companies started coming back. Several of them refused to bid on the project because they felt it wasn't going to work. 
Douglas, you also go to California, Ed Heinemann, the master aircraft designer there, the man who also helped design the SBD, the A1 Sky Raider, the A4 Skyhawk, among others, all Navy classics, came up with a 50,000-pound aircraft empty. And he said, not only will this work on a uh, your future carrier, but I'll be able to get it to work off a Midway class, uh, about 60,000 tons, and then it will also go aboard the smaller Essex. Navy initially said, you're nuts. He went to them and showed them all the engineering, and they finally said, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> so that's where the uh, originally called the A3D Sky Warrior came from. And as we intimated earlier, the A3D was not designed with ejection seats. That was a conscious decision, the Arena and Hyman's biography, for two reasons. One, weight. Uh, ejection systems at that time were very heavy, and weight was a critical factor in this airplane. Okay. The other one was, in that time frame, there were no ejection systems available that could protect or uh, have three-man crew who could rescue or save three men in the most critical parts of flight, which hmm. landing and taking off of the carrier. Right. Ejection seats were only starting to come out for single-seat aircraft in the late 40s, and even then didn't work below about 200 feet. Mm -hmm. The pilot would never have a chance to survive. And, of course, that technology evolved rapidly. Yes. And so the aircraft was designed without ejection seats and never got them. Well, and so that's what I'm hinting at is the terminology for the A3D yep. ended up with a bit of a derisive nickname, didn't it? That's correct. The A3D was uh, quickly became in the fleet all three dead. If you crash in one, you were going to be killed. In spite of that, there's some really remarkable stories of men surviving Sky Warrior crashes. But yes, quite a few of them ended up with that. Most veterans who flew the aircraft do not use that term loosely. Mm -hmm. But it is, you're right, it is kind of the sobriquet that the whale was based with. Most of us prefer the term whale. Yeah. It got that term in the late 50s as it was introduced. It seemed like a natural, and it stuck with the aircraft throughout its life. <laughs> well, the Air Force is famous for nicknames for all of its aircraft, it seems like, and so this one seems like a carryover from that. But I have to think, I was not an LSO, I don't know if you were, Rick, but seeing the A3 come aboard must have been a lot like a whale trying to come aboard. It was a big airplane. It was a big airplane, and you know, talk about size. It was the heaviest airplane we'd ever regularly put on aircraft carriers for a long time. 50,000-pound uh, max trap weight, wow. which we only gave it about five, 6,000 pounds of fuel. It had very little fuel coming aboard. The pilots who flew it had to be very good around the carrier, particularly at night if you're working off a, one of the smaller SX-27 Charlie carriers because just there's no room for air. Mm -hmm. I've stated to other people, they did it without a net because they didn't have an ejection seats. But that wow. being said, the, the A3 was overpowered when it was light. It had two remarkable engines, J57s, Pratt & Whitney engines, which were great, were the strongest parts of the entire airframe. Coming aboard, if you wanted to take it around, you always had the power to do that. The J57 also made the aircraft remarkably fast, a lot faster than most people think. It maxed out at 0.88 Mach. Wow. And down low, it would outrun many fighters as long as if they stayed out of burner. It would just leave them, which surprised a lot of people. You know, it was not particularly maneuverable, but it was it had straight line speed and power. All right. It was designed for a role that quickly went away, as we learned on this show, with the A-5 Vigilante <laughs> and the A-4 Skyhawk and some of the sister aircraft near the A-3 as far as nomenclature goes. But what did it end up doing mostly in the fleet? Mostly in the fleet, it got out of the nuclear strike role about 1963, 64. Uh, at that time, the Navy was trying to put on the, the Forrestal class and later class carriers, the supercarriers, 12 A3s in each squadron. They were heavy attack squadrons, VAH squadrons, with 12 aircraft. One or two would typically, once deployed, always be in the hangar bay with a weapon on board, surrounded by Marine guards on alert as part of the uh, PSYOP plan, the Single Integrated Operation Plan, wow. which was nuclear strike missions for the entire country. Mm -hmm. But as it started getting out of that, it went into, believe it or not, a conventional bombing role. The plane always was capable of carrying conventional gravity bombs, M-series or Mark 80 series. Mm -hmm. Early in the Vietnam War, they did quite a bit of bombing. It was designed to drop bombs using a radar system. It was a very good radar bomber. It had an excellent ASB-1 system and a radar system. Oh. And the bombardier navigator in the right seat, that was his role, and they were very good at it. The problem is in Vietnam, very few radar-significant targets, mm -hmm. and they tried picking up 30 and 45-degree dive bombing, which was uh, pretty wild and woolly because the plane didn't have a, a bomb site, and the pilots learned to use. Some of them would actually just put a grease pencil mark on the windscreen where they thought the bomb site should be. <laughs> One guy I know used the refueling probe, which stuck out the left side in front of the pilot as his marker. 
other guys just did it by guessing by golly. Wow. The use of Vietnam as a bomber ended pretty quickly because the plane was just too big, too vulnerable, and there were too many other planes that did a whole lot better. Mm-hmm. So the plane, you know, has been plumbed to carry a refueling air refueling package, and that became the role the plane was really best known for. The plane could carry a tremendous amount of gas, carried a hose and reel for a probe and drogue system in its bomb bay, mm-hmm. took up pretty much all the room there. 35,000 pounds of internal gas, which is roughly 5,100 gallons. Wow. A lot of guys and, and older aviators I talked to still consider the K-3 Sky Warrior as it became the gold standard 1F4 pilot, I know is what he calls it, for all Navy tankers because it was stable. It had a lot of fuel mm-hmm. and it could keep up with you, which is real important. We've had a couple of tankers in the fleet which couldn't keep up with the strikers because they're too slow, S3 being an example. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, now they've turned F-18s into tankers, which can keep up, but they're burning all the gas they're carrying. So you guys were probably a bit more efficient. <laughs> yeah, the A-3, like I said, the K-6 is the only one that even comes close. But even the K-6 only carried you know, about 23,000 pounds of gas. So it was 12,000 pounds less. Wow. But it was a lot smaller on the flight deck, and we had it in the fleet longer in large units. So the K-6 was a pretty important airplane, too, but nothing matched the whale. Mm-hmm. And that's where in Vietnam, where it really got its name, orbiting off the coast, covering strikers and picking up aircraft coming off the beach. The uh, whale guys developed a tactic called wet wing tanking, specifically for the A-4, which had uh, internal wing tanks, uh, wet wing tanks, that if they were hold, all the A-4's gas would come pouring out of. The tactic was if you could pick the guy up before it flamed out, plug him, you drag him, theoretically, all the way to the carrier and put him right behind the carrier, so all he has to do is drop his gear and flaps, and he lands. All this while he's all the gas you're pouring in, some's going to the engine. The rest is coming right out of the airplane, the holes in the airplane. They saved several hundred airplanes in Vietnam by doing stuff like that or F-4s. Wow. In my book, A-3 Sky Warrior Units over the Vietnam War, which is in the Osprey Comet Aircraft Series, the cover photo, the cover drawing is of a, of a gentleman named Tom Maxwell, who was flying with VH-4 Heavy 4 off the Oriskany in 67, saved an F-8 Crusader from VF-111, the Sundowners, where he went inland 30 miles. The individual, Dick Shaffert, I don't know both these gentlemen, Shaffert had been doing on-scene cap over an A-4 that had been shot down off the Oriskany, and he basically ran himself out of gas and was coming off the coast, pretty much figuring he's going to be ejecting near or at the coast. A good chance of becoming a POW. Tom Maxwell, the A-3 pilot, was off the coast, disobeyed standing 7th Fleet orders, which said absolutely no A3s were going over the beach because you're too vulnerable. You're just too big. Uh-huh. It's just too dangerous. He ignored the orders. Him and his two crewmen went in, dragged their hose, set up a perfect rendezvous with the help of an E1 tracer. Shafford had one chance, and he plugged, and Dick told me later that this fuel gauge was bouncing off empty in his Crusader, and Tom Maxwell and his crew saved him from uh, several years of eating pumpkin soup, so to speak. Yeah. Oh, man. Remarkable story. Because he did it against Seventh Fleet orders, Maxwell, they almost court-martialed him. Instead, they just agreed to forget the whole thing. He was never <laughs> given a decoration for what should have been, at the very least, a distinguished flying cross, if not Silver Star. Well, and when the two were together the rest of their lives, I'm sure Tom never had to buy himself a drink. Yeah, Maxwell was a remarkable, considered a remarkable A3 pilot. He lives in Boonville, Missouri now. Sure. Frightfully decent human being, really nice guy. Oh, cool. He would later go on to command VAQ-135 and the last year they flew Sky Warriors out of Alameda. Okay. Well, speaking of that, let's talk about some of the variants because you talked about the different roles, yep. but it was designed initially for the nuclear strike. But uh, after a while, you had the KA-3, as you stated, and then you also had EA-3s and RA-3s? Yes, that's correct. In the Sky Warrior world, in our community, we recently broke the whales down into two groups, bombers and versions. Bombers were everything that had bomb bays originally, and were used to drop ordnance. Those are the ones that became the tankers. Those became KAs. Okay. The versions were a special group. They pulled aside. They did not have bomb bays, but they carried other things in the belly. They had slightly different auxiliary configurations. They, we had two separate NATOPs because they were that different. Wow. Those are the ones I flew were the versions. They included an EA-3B, which was an electronic reconnaissance aircraft, which had seven seats in it. it. had five additional seats in what used to be the bomb bay, wow. which was used for electronic reconnaissance. They were operated by what are called VQ squadrons, doing just tremendous surveillance work from Vietnam on. Huh. The VQ guys, the A3B guys, were the last were in combat in Desert Storm. They had a pair of them flying out of Saudi Arabia at that point, doing what they've always done, a lot of ESM work and, and communications work. 
tremendous bunch of people. I know a bunch of them. Then there's the RA3B, the photo reconnaissance bird, originally called A3D2P. Instead of a bomb bay, it has a section behind the cockpit full of cameras, really high-quality cameras. And they did a lot of mapping work early in Vietnam. And then they got equipped with an IR detection system where they were trying to use them at night, flying down around two to 3,000 feet over North Vietnam, looking for campfires and other signs of activity. The RA-3Bs, uh, they were operated by a squadron called Heavy Photo 61, VAP-61, the most dangerous missions the whales flew in the war. They lost four airplanes over there, got shot down doing that mission. Uh, and sometimes you'll see pictures of them. They were later modified with a black, overall dull black paint scheme or a, a moldy shaded gray paint scheme long before it became fashionable in the rest of the Navy. Hmm. The final version was a TA-3B, which is uh, the one I got most of my time in. Eight seats. It was actually a training aircraft. We used it for pilot training, initially used for bombardier navigator training, actually. It had the three up front, five in back. Each seat had a radar repeater, so you could teach new navigators how to use the system and how to drop bombs from it. Several of them were also modified with, I want to say, uh, I forget which radar the RA-5 carried, but with RA-5 radars. And the vigilante rag used them down out of Key West and Sanford in Albany for several years. Okay. One was specifically modified, actually it was an EA-3, to be used as a the CNO's Chief Naval Operations, you could say uh, personal aircraft, flew out of Washington, D.C., out of Andrews, and allowed the Chief Naval Operations to have an aircraft where he could go long distances at high speed and still land on a carrier if he wanted to go visit a carrier. Yeah. And that airplane was famous, too. <laughs> That's crazy. Now, was it always flown with every seat occupied? And I don't mean no. the trainers, but okay. So, for example, it's an awful example, but just off the top of my mind, on John F. Kennedy on our 1999 deployment, an S3 crashed on takeoff, and I observed it firsthand. It was awful. But thankfully, it only had two in it instead of four. But I think a moment ago, you talked about the tanker mission, and all three guys were there. But could you go with one or two, or how did that work? Two would be minimum crew. It had three hards. We're talking the bombers here. It had three seats in it. Mm-hmm. The third seat was originally a gunner. The plane was originally built with a pair of 20 millimeter cannon in the tail, which never seemed to work. And that was a okay. requirement that Ed Heineman didn't like, and the Navy forced it on him. Okay. So by 1961, all the guns started coming out of the airplanes, and they put what we call a dovetail on it, a streamlined back end, which they stuffed full of electronic countermeasures, which they did need which was actually much more practical for what they were going to be doing. Yeah. So the funny part was the gunner sat back to back with the pilot. He actually faced aft as the third seat. He was always an enlisted air crewman, highly talented flight engineers who really knew the aircraft. And if you took a whale on a cross country, if you went into you know, flying around the country for a reason, you didn't go anywhere without your enlisted air crew because of the talent and the uh, knowledge they brought. Yeah. To, if, if the plane broke or something happened, they were there, they knew how to fix it. I love those guys. They were great. Oh, I bet. I bet. That's great. And then was there an Air Force version of this at some point? That's a great question. The Air Force in the middle 50s decided they needed a medium, what they called a medium bomber. They shopped around and they had the English electric B-57 Canberra, which wasn't quite what they wanted because uh, they wanted something that could carry special weapons, nukes. They went to Douglas, and they said, how about this A3 aircraft, A3D you're developing? And they went through a process and modified it heavily into what became the B-66 destroyer. (laughs) But they're not the same airplane. They're really distant cousins at best. The B-66, it's really funny. I know one guy who flew both, and his quote, I'll never forget, he said, the only thing these two airplanes share is the uh, shadow on the ramp. Because they look a lot alike, but they're really not. The B-66 had ejection seats. It had a different wing, a different fuselage, a different radar, different engines. It carried Allison J-71s and uh, J-57s. So they really were different aircraft. But the B-66 ends up having a almost very similar career to the A-3. It ends up, after being, a, for a couple of years, a nuclear strike weapon out of England, to becoming a photo reconnaissance aircraft, an electronic countermeasures aircraft. And the work the EB-66s did in Vietnam is epic, and they get very little credit for what they achieved. Hmm. There's a classic story, a movie called Bat 21. Oh, yeah. Gene Hackman, the book is better than the movie, in my opinion. I agree. Where Lieutenant Colonel Ikiel uh, Hamilton was shot down by an SA-2 over the DMZ. and That was an EB-66C, which was very closely analogous to an EA-3B. And like I said, they did epic work in Vietnam and never got a whole lot of credit for it. 
Well, too bad. Maybe we can help out a little bit with this show. Yeah. All right. So, did anyone else, other countries, or anyone fly it besides the Navy and the Air Force? No. Only the, oh. uh, the U.S. Navy is the only country that ever flew the A3D. It was never offered for export, largely because probably at that point, when it was in production, it went out of production in about 1962. We were basically not selling nuclear capable aircraft outside of Conus. Well, that makes sense. All right. And then, of course, our next item on the aircraft series list here for our episodes is the armament. You've already touched on it, so we don't necessarily have to get into the nuclear nomenclature, if you will, but some sort of weapons. And then you said general purpose weapons. And I guess the 20 millimeter didn't work too well, but what else in there? Yeah, that pretty much covers it. This is a story for you. A good friend of mine, gentleman I knew was a Navy captain, retired. But at that point, I'd been an A3 bombardier in Vietnam, and he recalls dropping bombs out of the bomb bay of this thing. And he said, we went through a bomb shortage in 66, 67, where we literally were running out of bombs and we were dropping so many. So they started digging into old World War II stocks in Guam and other places and coming up with old M-series, the big fat ones, just like you used to see dropping out of B-17s mm-hmm. with box fins and everything, crazy stuff. And But he said that some of them were so badly corroded. He said, you didn't know if the fins would stay on leaving the airplane or not. <laughs> And he says the really great part was because the A3 had an interior bomb bay, almost all the carriers preferred that the A3 carry the old dusty bombs, the ones that we weren't too sure about, because of the fast movers, the A4s and A6s, of course, would carry the low drag Mark series, Mark 80 series, because more suitable for them. Yeah. But they could carry that whole range of weapons, and that was about it. You know, by by 66, 67, they were out of the weapon dropping business, so. Was everything internal or anything external? No, it was all internal. Okay. There were hard points on the versions for a variety of things, jamming pods. The TA-3B could carry a, a practice bomb dispenser on a wing station because it didn't have a bomb bay. The RA-3 did carry photo flash bombs interior on its own special bomb bay, but that's about it. Okay. So this was, as you said earlier, electronic, I think you said reconnaissance, but it certainly wasn't electronic attack, so no harm, I'm guessing. No, harm would have been well uh, after. Okay. No strike either. The jammer version, the EK-3, another unremarked aircraft, was a modified tanker with a three-man crew, which carried a series of electronic jammers in the bomb bay called the ALT-27 series, and also called the ALQ-92 communications jammer. And they were used heavily late in the war. They were introduced in 67, and they flew through 72 as electronic attack aircraft doing radar and communications jamming up and down the coast. They were replaced by E-6Bs starting in 1972 okay. and were completely out of business by 1974. Fair enough. Now, design-wise on this aircraft, I mean, it was designed to duh, do its mission, but you talked about some of those smaller carriers it would have been adapted to. So this being a larger airplane, did it have any interesting features as far as like folding wings or tail or anything? I mean, everything had a folding wing on the aircraft carrier, but anything else to adapt it? Because it was? Yeah, the folding wing, uh, of course, was standard. The A3 is actually the tallest aircraft we've ever had on a carrier. Oh, wow. It is a nice piece of trivia, 22 feet, 9.6 inches to the top of the tail. It has a folding tail. It's an optional folding tail. You don't have to do it. There's a actually switch back in the uh, dovetail. You can rotate on whether or not you want to fold the tail. And that was only useful to get it under in the hangar bay. Mm-hmm. Even on the forestall class, you had to fold the tail. Wow. You see a lot of pictures with the wings folded and the tail still up. That's because they selected to stay up, which is normal, yeah. unless it's going to be stuffed in the hangar bay. And yeah, nothing else is really <laughs> the S3 is the only airplane that's even close to that. I think that was about a 22 foot tail itself, but it folded as well. With that's the S3. right. Yep. I can tell we got the right guy on the show here, uh, Rick. You definitely know your stuff, so appreciate you sharing it with us. Sure. How about performance? Let's talk about, you know, we can read in books about theoretical performance. What's the highest or fastest or most Gs you've ever pulled? It was a straight, fast line airplane. It was not a G puller. Okay. The deficiencies are not deficiencies, just things you had to, things that bite you in the butt if you, you let them get to you. The plane had remarkable range and speed for its time. I remember getting in a TA-3B at Key West one time, and we flew all the way to Sacramento, California, nonstop. Wow. It's a long ways. Nonstop at 0.88 Mach at about 50,000 feet. And the plane just sailed, and it carried eight guys and all the baggage we could carry. (laughs) Very few airplanes have that capability. It was great in that regard. It was not a G-pulling aircraft. Like three Gs was all, I forget what the G limit was. I don't have that in front of me, but you did not want to pull a lot of Gs. Another foible of the airplane. The auxiliary system was actually propelled by bleed air from the two engines. It ran up through the wings 
And then underneath the cockpit, we had two things called air turbine motors. They were generator and hydraulic pumps spun by bleed air, run by turbines spun by bleed air. Bleed air, as you're probably aware, is hot, nasty stuff. It's right off the engine. Mm -hmm. If you get a leak in your bleed air system, it's going to start a fire, and it's probably going to be catastrophic. It's something we watch for all the time. Fairly rare. I mean, it wasn't really common, but when it happened, you had to take care of it immediately. Part of the problem with ATMs is they were G intolerant and particularly negative G. We found this, unfortunately, a couple of times because it killed a couple of crews where guys put the A3 into negative Gs like a bunch or something for too long. The ATMs could quit, fail, and here you are with a plane screaming at the ground with no hydraulics or electricals. It's one of those things you just had to be aware of. Just you know, it's the old doctor it hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that. You know, <laughs> I say that we had a whale off the Ranger late EA three B with the seven gentlemen in it. That's apparently what happened. They had only one survivor of the seven, oh. and that's how we know what happened. Where they were negative gene the aircraft and the plane failed to pull out, broken half, and like one kid was thrown clear with his parachute and survived. Wow. So all planes have things you don't want to do with them. Right. And as an air crew under NATOP, you're supposed to know what they are. It's just a fact of the airplane. Yeah. How was it to fly? Was it a lot of work? Was it easy? Was it a delight? Was it a pain? I found it to be a lot of work. It was particularly maneuverable aircraft, but you know, there were guys that looped it. There were guys that turned it upside down. NATOP said you weren't supposed to do either. It was a handful. It used a yoke. It didn't have a stick. The Ooh. throttles were on the right side, which coming out of A4s was kind of a big change to me. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of really good A3 pilots out there. I could rattle off their names, but I won't, who routinely got the plane aboard and did it with a plume. Yeah. It's just one of those things. Tom Maxwell, the guy I mentioned earlier, a famous story about him doing what's called a tuck under break at the dang and getting in a whole lot sorts of trouble about it because if you understand a tuck under break, instead of breaking just straight to the left and pulling horizontally, you roll the aircraft in the opposite direction and do a 270 degree roll. Right. A3 is not supposed to do that, but he did it. You know, one of those pilots, very talented pilots who could uh, get away with doing stuff like that. Yeah. If you knew what you were doing, you can fly the plane with some maneuverability. Sure. But well, not so much. Yeah. You said, I think earlier, if I heard you correctly, you came out of training and went straight to it. So it wasn't yep. like some of the aircraft where they were only taking seasoned guys. I mean, do you recall some of your early CQ? What was it like to bring aboard? Was it, was I it never fire? brought an A3 aboard. Oh, you never did? Okay. Nope. I have never been aboard carrying an A3. I was land-based. Right. Anecdotally, uh, for your book, I'm sure you talked to people who did. So what was it like to bring aboard from your research? I talked to uh, LSOs, and I was not one, LSOs and pilots and it's one of those things the plane had a lot less margin for error behind the boat than more most other tactical aircraft the lso's always preferred to see it overpowered instead of if you get underpowered if you got low they were going to wave you off they just weren't going to take a chance on you but the plane was honest it was stable and like i said it, earlier it had a lot of power so as long as you knew what you were doing you were paying attention to business the plane was more than able to come on board a carrier and they did it mm -hmm. thousands of times safely and that's a testament to the pilots as well as the design and the LSOs and the whole team. Yep. This one is always kind of the weird question in the bunch, but strengths and weaknesses. I mean, it's an old aircraft designed for a very specific mission. Yep. I mean, was there one thing or maybe several that you loved about it that you would share with us? And then was there anything that was ever the thorn in your side? It sounds like that system you described under the pilot. ATMs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but what did you love about it? I love the aircraft just because it, the people had a lot to do with that. We had such great people in the A3s, in particular enlisted airmen, mm. just the characters and rogues. And the squadron I was in VAQ-33 was a, a remarkable place to be as an ensign, which is where I joined them. Just a lot of Vietnam War vets. But the airplane itself, because of its speed, its range, just its presence, people respected mm -hmm. the whale just because of what it was. The fact you flew a whale was a matter of pride. Mm -hmm. That's what I loved about the aircraft and its longevity. Yeah. The plane was remarkably adaptable to all these mission areas. I mean, it was used even after the Navy retired the last one, 91. They kept a small number of them working for, I think it was Raytheon down in Van Nuys, California for several years because of its use as an electronics test airplane. Huh. My buddy Ron Waltman flew it into uh, Pensacola. The last one, whale that flew was a Pensacola. Ron flew it in on, oh, I'll find the date. There it is, 30 June 2011. So oh, wow. 20 years after the Navy retired the aircraft, the last A3 was retired. What makes this amazing is because his cousin, the B-66, at the end of the Vietnam War, the Air Force couldn't get out of the B-66 fast enough. They retired and scrapped practically every 
B-66 built and from one year after the end of, the, well, two years after the end of the Vietnam War. By the end of 74, they were completely out of business. The Navy kept theirs through 91 in service and then, you know, boat service through 88. Mm-hmm. And then three more years, they were still being used off the beach. And then through 2011, contractors were still flying A-3s. So That's crazy. Longevity is a great piece of this airplane's uh, history. I would say so. And I'm guessing it's no coincidence the last flight was to Pensacola, where there happens to be a very large naval aviation museum. That's exactly why it went there. Yep. (laughs) Okay. Notoriety. So the F-14 obviously has Top Gun, the movie, to thank. Does A-3 have any public awareness, if you will? Little or none. It is kind of (laughs) funny on the movie uh, Fly the Intruder. There is a sequence with an A-3 in there, which surprised a lot of us. Sure. Where one is stuffed in the hangar bay, it's an RA-3. You can tell by the configuration of the windows. The guys who did the movie Fly the Intruder went to a lot of trouble to crane dead airplanes on, on board the carrier they were filming, which I believe is Independence, to make it look like a Vietnam-era carrier. You know, an A-3 gets a cameo in the Fly the Intruder movie. They also craned F-4s on board, non-flyable F-4s for the same purpose. Yeah. A-3 is one of those airplanes that's what I call an overlooked classic of naval aviation. Mm-hmm. because of its reputation and like you said you talk to a lot of people not familiar with it the first thing they say is "Ooh, all three dead that kind of stings because uh, yeah. there's a certain amount of truth to that but it's the way the plane was designed it is what it was that's right it's, i stand by it so. well and it's from an era that it's hard to look at now and say oh gosh why didn't they do this that or the other i mean golly lots changed in the what 70 80 years since then so yeah it's I'm going to say funny, but it's starting from the late 50s, almost annually, Nav Air or somebody started asking, why don't we retrofit ejection? By that time, we had ejection seats that could fit in an airplane and we would have a chance of survival at low altitudes. Yeah. And so from the late 50s, they started almost every year, they started asking a question, why don't we retrofit our whales with ejection seats now? We can do this. The answer kept coming back. Well, they're going to retire them in a couple of years. It's not worth the cost. That's right. In 1960, you know, in 65, they're about, no one saw it lasting until 1991. You know, the A3D went aboard the Forrestal for the first time in 1956. Brand new carrier, brand new aircraft, and it shared the flight deck with airplanes like the Sky Ray and the Demon, the Sky Raider, other all classics. None of them lasted nearly as long as the Sky Warrior. You know, when the Sky Warrior retired in 91, it was on, you know, went aboard the carrier in 88. It was on flight deck with Tomcats, Vikings, Hornets. Remarkable longevity. No doubt. Is there a particular famous video, and by famous, at least for naval aviators, of an A3 that tried to barricade one night, but then maybe got waved off and hit the top of the barricade? Or am I confusing that with a different aircraft? That was one of the mishaps that led to the end of the whale at the boat. I have a good friend of mine who was actually on the platform that night. He was in El but he wasn't on the, the uh, pickle that night. Mm-hmm. Yes, VQ-2, that's the, the electronic reconnaissance squadron out of Rota, Spain, had an aircraft crash in the med on the Nimitz. The story was they got airborne at night. The pilot was having a lot of trouble landing, probably a marginal pilot. He made multiple passes at the flight deck, could not land. He was boltering or being waved off, boltering, being dragging the hook without catching a wire. Multiple passes. I forget how many he made that night. They tried to send him to an A-7 tanker to refuel to give him gas, enough gas to fly to a, the, the bingo, the diver. The A-7 was sour. It didn't work. Tanker package did not work. So now he was stuck. He didn't have enough fuel to bingo. He had to come aboard. So they rigged the barricade on the Nimitz. There were some problems and issues with the barricade. It was not set up correctly. The pilot came in and flew a high pass, basically flew through the barricade and ended up right off the port side of the ship. And the aircraft sank with all seven men on board. Oh. One of the greatest tragedies in A3 history. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that was a pretty sad story. That called into question, why are we still flying these airplanes and carriers? Once again, the A3 with seven seats, they would never have put seven ejection seats in that airplane. It just wasn't going to happen. Right. Realize the E2 Hawkeye still flies around carriers without ejection seats. It's, it doesn't have them either. So That's true. But it's a lot slower, and it's considered uh, you know, a different airplane, which it is. Yeah. Hey, just off topic real quick, because you threw out a bunch of aircraft designs that all start with the word sky. Uh, so can we thank Ed Heineman for the Sky Raider, the Sky Warrior, the Skyhawk? The, are all these his designs? They're all his designs. Ed, uh, his biography, which uh, was co-written by a good friend of mine named Zip Rouza, who's now deceased, came out of Naval Institute years ago. And he talks about all those airplanes. Heineman really started at Douglas uh, under Jack Northrup back when he was there. 
mm-hmm. takes to help design the SBD Dauntless. Uh, he was one of the lead designers for that, which is where he cut his teeth. But then all the other great Douglas platforms, the Sky Ray, the Sky Knight, all these great airplanes that Douglas built in the 50s for the U.S. Navy. Heinemann was a chief designer for almost all of them. Yeah, well, we've featured quite a few here on the show. So, yeah. like I said, we almost need to bring you back, Rick, or someone else to uh, talk about that because that sounds like a cool story in itself. So, hey, I've got some listener questions that I didn't tell you I was going to ask, but sure. if you don't mind, we'll uh, get through these. And normally I have a chance to read these in advance, but you and I ended up scheduling this somewhat last minute. And so yeah. I did a fadeaway jumper for our special Patreon supporters. These are folks who help financially support the show, and so they get special perks. One of those is to ask questions, and I haven't had a chance to QA these is what I'm saying, Rick, so I'm just going to throw them at you. If we've already answered them, then you can tell me that. That's fine. Joseph says, Joseph's question leads in with the ejection seats, which I know we did cover. So then he says, did crews practice regularly how to get out of the aircraft quickly in the event of an emergency, and could you talk through the steps of that? So, I mean, you don't have to go into each individual step, but whether ground egress or bailout, what were the practices there? There were two ways in or out of a Skyward cockpit. We'll talk about the bomber because they're both very similar with the versions. Basically, there was a hatch overhead, which was opened at all times during takeoff or landing in case you, you belly landed or something. It was the only way out. But the primary way in was a hatch behind the cockpit that flopped down and trailed aft. If in the event of an emergency bailout, you're all sitting on your parachutes and survival packs, of course, the pilot would call for bailout. He'd reach down. There's a handle right underneath his right bottom on the seat. He'd pull that. It would pneumatically blow down the ejection chute, the slide as it was. And then in order, pause three, the enlisted man, and then the bombardier nav, pause two, and then pause one, the pilot would stand up, rotate, and he grabbed a handle. Were there ever any successful bailouts? Oh, yeah. Stricken? More than you would imagine. I just had an article written in the Aviation Foundation magazine a couple months ago of a successful three-man bailout at night at sea oh. on the Bonham Richard after a ramp strike. The pilot hit the back of the carrier and tore up his airplane. Still got airborne, and they were still able to bail out all three, and all three were saved by the two good friends who bailed out of an airplane out of control over the Rocky Mountains. God, I was at about 72. It was an EK-3. They launched out of Buckley uh, National Guard Base, went into a uh, thunderstorm, and the plane lost control. And they had four guys on board. The plane had a jump seat for a fourth person if you needed it, you wanted it. And all four successfully bailed out and survived in the middle of the Rocky Mountains in a snowstorm. Wow. So <laughs> that's a hell of a story. And two of those guys went on to command Prowler Squadrons. Outstanding. It was possible. And how did you practice it? Uh, you literally, once a year, they'd roll a big, thick mattress underneath the aircraft, and you'd physically go down the chute from the cockpit and land in the mattress just to prove you can do it. That's so, crazy. All right. Next question. Let's see. We've got one about uh, landing on the carrier and bolters. I think we've answered that one, John. Thank you. Another John asks, the A3 was adapted to many roles throughout its service. We talked about these, Rick. Were there any roles that were conceptualized but never taken to production? Uh, That's a great question. Yes. (laughs) They actually looked at making it into a long-range interceptor. Ed Heinemann, there's one great book out by my old friend Rene Francion on the A3 where he shows drawings of some of the concepts that Heinemann pitched to the Navy but were not taken up. One was at a long-range interceptor where they would be carrying a missile similar to Phoenix, which later went on the F-14. You could carry about six of them on a whale. We're going to put a big high-power radar on it, too. So that never happened. (laughs) I believe there's an airborne early warning version they pitched, which was going to have big radars in the nose and tail that was never built either. Well, again, you are definitely the authority on this, so appreciate all that. All right, Sam wants to know how much or how long was any extra training required for the nuclear mission, and was the mission designed to be one way, or could the crew return after delivery? Now, I'm going to take a stab at the second one, Rick, because earlier you said it was designed for a one-way mission of a 1,000 miles, and I thought, "Uh uh-oh, and then you said, and return. So I think what you meant was the combat radius. But And we've talked about on this show before with our A7 guest and a few others. The PSYOP, as you said earlier, was a big involvement. There was inspections, there was training and planning and everything. What would you tell Sam about that mission? And is that something you did? No, I did not. That was long past. The uh, okay. A3 gave up that mission in the early 60s because of the success of the, literally because of the uh, Polaris missile, sub-missile program. Right. You just didn't need a big heavy airplane like the A3 doing that anymore. Yeah, they were trained, and their mission was to go deep into Russia or China, which were the obvious candidates, 
with a single weapon in the bomb bay. In some cases, they actually practice to uh, take a tanker package along with a weapon and drag A4s with them to allow the A4s to go even further into the target with them because they can carry special weapons as well. Hmm. They train for it and practice for it a lot. The guys I knew at Whidbey that flew it in Heavy uh, Attack Wing 2 used to do radar bombing in Spokane and Moses Lake, I think it was the other place. And they did had a derby, a bombing derby, every year. That was the thing where you trained and acted like you were really attacking a place. And they had scores on the ground that could tell you how accurate you were. Mm-hmm. What kind of CEP were these guys getting? Honestly, I don't know. Okay. I honestly uh, can't answer that. You know, the term a shack would have been perfect. And I have heard stories of guys shacking with a nuclear weapon. I guess you could argue how important that is. <laughs> but that was the goal. Yeah. The weather they thought was survivable. No, most of these guys felt it was going to be a one-way mission. When the balloon went up, it's not exactly a major Kong from Dead Doctor Strange Love, but most of these guys felt the A3 as much as as it was going to go one way, and they would be lucky, honestly, lucky to make it to the target. And the idea of coming back was uh, not considered very likely, not very likely. Mm -hmm. I talked to one guy that flew both whales and vigilantes, and he thought the vigilante was much more capable in that role and for obvious reason it's a whole lot quicker it's oh, a yeah. supersonic dash than the whale the a3 was a3 you know would have been vulnerable to fighter attack if they could get up to it and if they had the time to warn it there was one a3 shot down by a chinese migs during the vietnam war huh. killed i think four men i think four men were on that one hmm. they blundered into hainan island hmm. which is sovereign chinese country and big 19s came up blew them out of the air so that sucks. the plane was not particularly survivable in a heavy environment. It did carry electronic countermeasures that would help against surface air missiles, but nobody really wanted to ever see how well that worked. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Next question is from Brian, who says the A3 and the B-66 were later used as testbed aircraft. For example, the B-66 for the F-15 radar and the A3 for the Phoenix by Hughes. Yep. Uh, outside of the weapons bay, what other characteristics about the airframe made it suitable for testing? Maybe stability or handling? Maybe, I would argue, just availability. But you did say this had an extended story in the civilian sector, huh? Yeah, I did. It lasted about 20 years longer because yeah. there was a number of them that were modified when they called NA3Bs or NRA3Bs. We used them at Point Magoo for years. And, and like yeah. the one mentioned, uh, the first Phoenix missile launchers I'm aware of were off an A3. They carried on a, a special pylon built under the nose, off the side of the nose. But the volume and the fact it was uh, not an ejection seat aircraft, probably has something to do with it because you could easily find civilian contractors who could jump in and fly the aircraft without special training. That's another thing. Oh, yeah. But the station time and, again, the speed of the aircraft, the volume in the bomb bay, you could put all sorts of amazing stuff in it if you wanted to work on i've seen pictures i've and i've seen cases where they would put a strike seeker an agm-45 strike iteration missile in the front end of the nose and so you would basically testing the capability of the seeker with an operator sitting right behind it in the bombardier seat reading all the telemetry on his uh, gear hmm. and so you could see in flight how the strike reacted we did the same thing with tomahawk i have a picture of a a3 out of Point Magoo with a Tomahawk missile you know, functionally sticking out of its nose. It's not the real missile. It's just a shape with the, the, the electronics in it. Mm-hmm. Same thing, though. So you have a guy real-time who could watch and record how the Tomahawk hardware was operating in, the, in a flight environment. And that's mm-hmm. pretty, pretty valuable stuff. Okay. William wants to know, with the EKA-3, which of the three missions did they either do the most or enjoy the most? Uh, electronic attack, the tanking, or the attack? And I guess by that point, the, the A of A3 attack role had kind of gone away. But I guess, I don't know, I'll take a stab at this if you don't mind, Rick. Sure. Like in an F-18 squadron, it's an F-A-18. They don't bother calling it the KAF-18. But you kind of do one of everything, and people like different roles. But was the tanker role, if you will, kind of parsed out to different squadrons and if they had a A3 squadron on board, it was just something they also did, or was it a specific aircraft? In other words, could you just slap the pod on and go, or was it its own aircraft? No, the EK-3 was heavily modified by uh, the depot in uh, Alameda. Okay. It had all the electronics gear. The jamming gear was permanent on it. It also carried the tanker package. You're right. The attack mission, the original plan for the EK-3 was what they, they actually called it the TACOS airplane, T-A-C-O-S, uh-huh. tanker countermeasures or strike. Well, really not long into the ek 
period, they realized we don't have room in the bomb bay for bombs anymore, and it, it'd still be stupid to make it a bomber. So they ripped up all the bombing gear out of it. So it became a tanker and jammer, and they did both. They did both roles, and airplanes could do both roles, and not at the same time. You can't run the jammers when you're passing gas. That's a bad idea. Mm-hmm. But I've talked to crews who, you know, mission planning was we take off, we tank a couple of aircraft, and we run to a jamming point 10 miles off the coast, orbit there for 20 minutes, then we run back, and then tank guys coming off target. <laughs> so it was a remarkably versatile aircraft in that regard. Most of the tanker squadrons at that point on the big decks, by that time, we started out with 12 airplane squadrons, which you can find pictures and you imagine how much aluminum that means, how much deck space that yeah. takes. By the Vietnam War, most of the tanker squadrons were taking five aircraft out. Of those, three would be jammers, the EKs, and then they'd have two KAs assigned just to do tanking. And that seemed to be a pretty good mix. Okay. The small deck carriers, the Essex, were carrying three airplanes, and that's all they had ever carried uh, as a rule. Well, a smaller carrier, too. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, got some questions here from Neil Hodgins. First one I'm going to answer, was the rear turret useful at all? I believe you said no. Nope. <laughs> okay, and then what was the accommodation like in the electronic surveillance variant? Did the operators have elbow room, or was it like a tight fighter cockpit with no windows? And then, let's see, did the operators give any opinions on ball flying and landings? <laughs> the operators were down in a tube, seated sideways. They, hmm. The five seats lateral, you know, from four to aft. They could see, look up into the cockpit, but they could not see out the window. They did not know what was going on. Wow. Uh, they would rotate their seat 90 degrees forward, so they're facing forward for the trap mm-hmm. and betting on the quality of the pilot to bring them aboard. So they didn't have much to offer. They were doing their jobs down there, and they're really good. Right. A typical crew back there of five seats would have been one officer and four enlisted men, each one trained in a specific part of the mission. And realizing they were doing national level intelligence work. I mean, their work was the stuff the NSA and the CIA looked at. Mm-hmm. So really critical mission. And they were enormously talented individuals in the VQ communities. Oh, I imagine. Well, on that note, Alexander wants to know if the A3, as he's read online, was used to conduct reconnaissance flights against Warsaw, the Warsaw Pact, beginning in the 50s. You have, you have any info on that? Yeah, VQ-2, the Rotobay Squadron. Uh-huh. The mission was called PARPRO, Peacetime Air Reconnaissance Program. and which was the title used for pretty much all the DOD airplanes that flew the periphery missions off Warsaw Pact, Russia, China, Korea, all those countries. So yes, the answer is is yes. Fair enough. And then a couple other people had questions we've already answered, or you said you never took it to the boat, so I'm going to skip any of those. But Rick, you are a wealth of information. Any You've already shared some stories. Any good personal anecdotes or any other good sea story, including the A3 that you want to share with us? I uh, got a lot of sea stories involving the A3. I think it <laughs> ended with one of my favorites. There was a gentleman who flew off the Ticonderoga in uh, off Vietnam. And I'll think of his name here in a second. But he was a, a officer in charge of the BH-4 debt on board. And the ship, the Tyco, was being chased. This is a little 27 Charlie Assis class. And mm-hmm. They were being chased around by a Russian AGI and a Soviet reconnaissance ship or intelligence gatherer, usually just bugging the snot out of them. The AGI kept cutting in front of the carrier and blowing his horn and just being annoying because the carrier has to travel a certain specific direction at you know 30 knots in order to launch and recover aircraft. And this Russian, the Soviet ship, was just driving them crazy because it was feigning collision and all that stuff. John Wunsch was this gentleman's name, and the Red Baron was his call sign. And Wunsch was coming in and landing one day on the Tyco, and this AGI gets in the way, and the ship has to make an emergency turn, so Wunsch can't land. So he really gets hacked off, and he flies low over the AGI and turns on all the fuel dumps. So now he's pouring GP5 out of his airplane very quickly all over the AGI. And uh, it says from then, he got aboard the next pass, and from then on, the the ship never bothered them. Oh boy! See, that's kind of a, an attack role in a sense. It's yeah, just using right. a, a fuel type of weapon. Oh boy! Well, tell us more about your book, Rick. What's it titled, and where can we find it? My book is uh, A3 Skywar Units of the Vietnam War. Is uh, Osprey Combat Aircraft Series 108. It was published in 2015. It's a pretty good short, about you know, not even 100 page softbound. You can find information on my books on my website, RickMorganBooks.com. I've written five books so far in naval aviation and written, God, I don't know, 50 articles or so for mostly for professional and enthusiast magazines. Excellent. Well, we'll be happy to link to that in your books. And what's the future hold? Any more books in works or what are you working on? I've promised my Prowler community, all my brothers and Prowlers, that 
I'm going to write a big book on them. And <laughs> I've been stuck at halfway through it for like, because of work for like eight years now. So I got to get <laughs> off my tuchus and finish yeah. that book up because the Prowler is a, another massively underrepresented airplane in aviation history. Let's face it. It's not a Tomcat or a Phantom, but it's a fascinating aircraft manned by just tremendous men and women. Mm until it was retired by the Navy in 2015 and the Marine Corps last year. So, you know, Vitally important, but not necessarily the most sexy. As you and I are recording this in the late summer of 2020, we have not yet featured the Prowler, but we hope to do that. And we sometimes bring back guests who were with the show to co-host it. So you said you had quite a bit of Prowler experience. Maybe we'll have to bring you back. Just give me a call. I'll be more than welcome to. <laughs> it's a great airplane. Awesome. So now the last question we always ask on the show is about call signs. I haven't been using one for you, and you were kind of in in the attack community, which back then they didn't do a lot of call signs. So anybody come up with anything fun for Rick Morgan? The only one that came close to sticking was Boris. As in someone accused me of acting like Boris Badenoff once in the ready room, and I won't go into why. But Is it bad if I don't know who that is? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Boris Badenov, Moose and Squirrel, if you ever watched Rocky and Bullwinkle. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, yes. Boris Badenov was uh, like, the Russian agent. Yeah, 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 yeah. He had to chase him around. He used to chase Moose and Squirrel around. That's right. He just thought of was being a sneaky b- <laughs> decided that uh, that'd be a good call sign for me. It stuck around for about two years and then vanished. It, uh, it went away. Uh, that's the closest I've ever come to a real call sign that's stuck. Yeah, awesome. Good stuff. And a skipper called me Flash for a couple of years, and I've never understood quite why. That went on the side of an airplane, actually, so of a prowl. Oh. So that one didn't stick. As soon as the skipper left, the call sign went with him. So. All right. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just Rick. We'll just plan on calling you Rick unless there's one you particularly want. You know, you're at the point in your life where you can give yourself a cool call sign, like assassin or something, <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> you never assign your own call signs. I can tell you stories of call signs, and a lot of them are very funny, and a lot of them not good for polite company. Oh, for sure. But you know what, Rick? So this is as good a place as any to talk about this. So there's a lot of coffee table books about World War II art, which also aren't appropriate on aircraft anymore. Yep. The, I guess the difference is those are visually significant, but someone needs to do a coffee table book on call signs because there's some really great ones out there. <laughs> I have a couple of guys I know who could write that. Uh, Dave H. O. Parsons, a very famous F-14 Rio, would be a great source. Like I said, I got something I probably can't say on the radio with uh, the blog, but some of them are innocuous, but they have really funny backgrounds. Oh, yeah. So I, I won't go into them right here, though. Okay. Fair enough. Well, Rick, you've been a good sport today, and you really uh, taught me a lot on the A3. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, everyone else learned something. What did I not ask you about the A3 or any parting thoughts on it? Like I said, it was not really a uh, unremarked classic. And naval aviation deserves a lot of credit for what it did in the Navy. You know, it has kind of a, a bad rep when it does deserve it. And had a lot of fun flying in it, though. Awesome. Well, thanks for stopping by today. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Once again, big thanks to Rick Morgan for joining us to describe the A3 Sky Warrior and also my big apologies for sitting on this interview for the past year. But we got it. I hope you really enjoyed it. Now, I don't know about you, but the 50,000 pound max trap just sounded amazing to me. And if you know anything about the FA-18 Hornet, at least the legacy, it was 34,000 pound max. And I thought, okay, well, maybe this is the biggest, but I talked to some F-14 friends and they said, actually, that jet was 54,000 pounds, but of course they didn't land on some of those smaller carriers. So just an amazing aircraft. I actually am in email contact with Tom Maxwell. In fact, I read his book, Grandfather's Journal where he chronicles flying the various A3s. Boy, that's a good book. Take a look at that if you're interested. Just a little bit more about the Sky Warrior or the Whale. Uh, Let's see. I did have a misspeak regarding, I think I said something along the lines of all carrier aircraft have folding wings. Those of you who know better, you probably were throwing things at the radio there. Of course, the A4's wings were so small, they did not fold. And again, the F-14 didn't fold its wings. It just overswept them. And that made a little bit more room on the flight deck. But yeah, the A4, I guess they decided was small enough. It didn't need to have folding wings. So that's pretty cool. And then the story of the last A3 flying in and uh, retiring reminded me that just recently in here in July in San Diego, the very last S3 Viking flew and it landed in San Diego and it's on its way destined to the Air and Space Museum where we can all go take a look at that. But yeah, I guess NASA was flying them a few years after the Navy retired them and now they hung them up. All right, and then finally, 
You know, any aircraft mishap that involves a fatality is tragic. But once in a while, when there's an aircraft mishap with a lot of souls on board, well, we just want to point them out. We did that on the AC-130, and we'd like to do it again here. So, we are dedicating this episode 118 of the Fighter Pilot Podcast to the crew of Ranger 1-2 of VQ-2. And that is Lieutenant Commander Ronald Callender, Lieutenant Stephen Bachelder, Lieutenant Alan Levine, Lieutenant James Richards, AT-2 Richard Herzing, CTI-3 Patrick Price, and CTI-3 Craig Rudolph. Rest in peace, gentlemen. All right, well, that will do it for this week. I'd like to thank our new Patreon strike lead, William Lee. And we want to remind everyone that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So that'll do it for this week. Now, as I alluded to last time, next month we have a change of pace. We're going to take a break from our regular scheduling and instead simulcast the first couple episodes of The Merge, our new episodic show. And this will be the first couple episodes of season one. It's about a midair collision in Fallon in 2008. So you'll hear my voice, but really it's about the characters involved. Season two that we're already working on will actually be with a different host, but I hope you'll enjoy that. And then we'll be back in early September to discuss what's coming on the show. And that's right. We are debuting an all new podcast dedicated to the F-14 Tomcat. We'll give you more on that as it gets a little closer to release date on September 14th. Otherwise, that'll do it. Thanks so much for listening and supporting the show. We really appreciate all of you, and we hope you've enjoyed your stay here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BBR Productions. Got a question for the show? Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com. Or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening.